Let's welcome everybody to another midweek teaching. And today's presentation is called Christian Cruelty. Folks, I'm sure that many of you have either noticed, witnessed, or maybe even experienced when Christians are behaving in a cruel fashion. I'm going to suggest that oftentimes I think this is happening because people feel justified in their cruelty because people maybe don't interpret the scriptures the same way they do. I'm going to suggest that scriptures don't allow us to move into Christian cruelty even when people disagree. In fact, we are supposed to continuously walk in Christian kindness. Does the scriptures bear this out? I believe they do. So, let's dig in. All right, so here we are in 1 Peter. Before we get going, please allow me to just mention that we do have a membership here on YouTube. Uh, There's three tiers. Um, There's gold and uh, platinum that have a Feed the Sheep series, and you might be interested in that. We already have, I think, at least 10 um, episodes uploaded for members there. And we also have a, a lower tier called uh, Silver, I believe it is. And it uh, starts at $2.99. And um, I have some music there. And sometimes I release uh, videos early there as well. So in case you can afford to support the ministry, we greatly appreciate it. And of course, we always appreciate your prayers and kind comments and sharing the videos. So we appreciate all of it. All right, so here we are in First Peter. So before we get going, I just want to mention, I'd love to do the entire epistle, but I just picked sections to really prove the point that at all times, even when people disagree with us, we are supposed to default to love, kindness, mercy, and grace. That is the primary position of Christianity. That's how we walk in the love of God continuously. All right, so notice what Peter says here, fairly front end of the epistle. He says, as obedient children... Okay, so there's a degree of obedience here, but obedience includes grace and mercy. In fact, I'm going to suggest it leads with it, right? Not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance, right? And again, we talked about this in the um, counterfeit Christian video, which I don't care for that terminology, but um, it exists, that it's based on lusts, uh, but lusts aren't always just, let's say, adultery. It's also when we're hateful and we're using spiteful words and things of this nature, all right? But as he which hath called you is holy, so be you holy in all manner of conversation. Now, please let's note, he says all manner, okay? All manner of conversation. That's not just speaking, but it can include it indeed. It's all conduct and behavior. So I wanted to show you, because this is old English, guys. We're using old King James. But I wanted to show you how the word means your conduct, okay? That's what it is. Conversation, it can include how you speak and why you're saying what you're saying, indeed, but it's all conduct, all right? That's the um, definition of the word. It says how you deal with other people, your conduct, your life, your behavior, your manner of life, okay? Very, very important for us to understand that he says here in First Peter, be you holy in all manner of behavior and conduct, All right, so there's not a lot of room for exception here, okay? So we have to be very, very attentive to this because it is written, be you holy for I am holy. So what is being said there? See, folks, people think, you know, we're going to be separate from the world. Okay, but that doesn't mean to be separate in the sense of, you know, get a tent and go in the forest somewhere. That's not what that means. It means that you're going to be separate. You're going to be unique. You're going to be different because in all manner of your behavior, it will always be, unique because it will always be led with agape love grace mercy truth and practice what you preach etc etc all right and that's why he says next he says and if you call on the father okay who without respect of persons all right we have to include this in our theology because what i'm also suggesting is that because people think that their belief means they escape all review all judgment and things of this nature, they're actually putting themselves in the position where when they do something wrong, they're justified in wagging their fingers, even though they have done and oftentimes continue to do um, things that are indeed malicious and inappropriate in other or many different ways of conduct. All right. And notice that he says the father has, there's no respect of persons. 
All right, we got to pay attention to that. We have to fit that into our understanding of scripture. And he says that the father judges according to every man's work. And again, without respect of persons, okay? Every man, all right? And you're going to see both, by the way, that I'm going to make the case that this judgment is for believers and unbelievers alike, okay? I'm going to show you that the scriptures support that position, at least something worth considering, all right? Because every man means every man. And if he's respect, he's, he doesn't have any respect of persons, then he doesn't have any respect of persons. And that's why Peter is even saying to the church, the believers at the time, so therefore pass your time of your sojourning here in fear, right? Meaning high, high reverence to the Father. In other words, don't say that you believe and then operate opposed. And again, it's in all manner of behavior. And you're going to see that this is going to connect to the fruits of the Spirit that's in Galatians. Peter is going to say many, many very similar, sometimes even the same things that Paul did. And I'm going to suggest that Jesus did. You're going to see a continuing steady stream of we aim to walk the straight path even when we disagree or people disagree with us. All right. And he continues here and he says, for as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain, empty behavior, empty conduct received by what? Tradition of your fathers. Okay. So we now, if I were to apply this to today, we have to watch what we've created as traditions, because if we could create a lot of traditions and then we start wagging the fingers because they don't agree with these traditions. And I would include things like Crete's. Okay, nowhere here does he say, be holy in how you confess the Nicene Creed or how you confess the Athanasian Creed. These are all things that were like 300 years after Christ. So Peter's never talking about things of that nature. And you're going to see as we move forward that that indeed is the case. And this is very similar to dragging yourself or putting yourself under all kinds of traditions, laws, bylaws, especially religious rudiments. And then all of a sudden, because you're performing those religious rudiments or you have certain textual understandings as to what you're supposed to be doing, that that now justifies you to become cruel and then still claim you're a Christian. And I'm going to suggest to you, there's no room for that. All right. So we'll continue in first Peter chapter one at verse 25. It's not the greatest chapter break, but flows right into chapter two here. And that's how we're going to grab it. Okay. It says, but the word of the Lord endures forever. So let's see what he's talking about when he's talking about the word of the Lord. And this is the word, which by the gospel is preached unto you. Wherefore, laying aside all malice, see where he goes right into conduct, right into conduct. All right. It's very, very important that we catch that, right? Because the word of the Lord and the gospel is attached to laying aside malice, laying aside all guile, not some, all of it, right? And hypocrisies. And this is very, very important that we understand that we lay aside the malice and the guile because what ends up happening, folks, when we start justifying ourselves based on our interpretation of the text rather than leading with love others as self and remaining on the straight path, what ends up happening is because we start to glorify our own interpretation of the text and make that more important and start making traditions and rudiments and belief systems more important than actually caring about other people, what ends up happening is we end up becoming very hypocritical hypocritical because we say that they shouldn't do ABC. And at the same time, we're saying and doing things that we shouldn't be doing, right? So that's how we should be interpreting the text through always loving others as ourselves, even if they're not operating or doing or saying the things that we don't think they should be doing and saying, okay? So in other words, despite the disagreement, all right, we're supposed to lay aside all envies and look at this guys. And this is exactly what Paul was talking about in Galatians, all evil speakings, all right? So that's what it says, all evil speakings. We should not be leaning towards evil speakings. That's the deal. It's not you can speak evil if they disagree with you, all right? Or you can speak evil if they don't confess this or do that or agree with this. Es eschatology is another one, right? But rather as newborn babes, right? So there's that humility part, which Jesus says, come to the kingdom like a child. So you're, you, everyone knows that scripture. So you see how that kind of, you know, as newborn babes, right? Being a little humble, if you will, desiring the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. And you cannot grow folks if you're in malice in guile and in hypocrisies and envies and you're speaking evil. You can't grow. You won't be able to grow like that. All right. You will just remain in the exact same spot you were before. You might think you know things better. That might be true too. But at the end of the day, if you are constantly wagging your fingers and speaking evil, it will prevent your growth because you need the humility in order to grow in the right direction and properly. All right. If so be 
you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. So what is he saying here? He's saying, and to me, it's very, very clear. He's saying, these are the things that you will start to lay aside, right? If indeed you have received and understand and or accept and or confess that the Lord has been gracious to you. Okay. So however you want to interpret that, the Lord's grace is supposed to move you to avoid these types of things. Okay. And then we'll continue in 1 Peter chapter 2, still in chapter 2, a little bit later on in the text, he says, For so is the will of God, that with well-doing, well-doing, how, how do you put to silence the ignorance of foolish men? How do you do that? By slamming your fists, by uh, coercing them, uh, calling them names if they don't agree with you, things of this nature, using terms like heretic or whatever. Is that how you do it? Is that how you silence the ignorance of foolish men? And in other words, if you think I'm ignorant and foolish, you know how you make you, you know how you silence me by doing well. That's how you do it. Okay. And same thing. If I think that you're doing something ignorant and foolish, the best way I can potentially silence you is through well-doing. Now, I don't believe that Peter means that you'll never be able to say anything. I think what is going to happen is when you consistently operate according to the fruits of the Spirit, as we covered in the uh, fruits of the Spirit part of the video in Christian uh, counterfeit Christianity, we talked about the fruits of the Spirit. When you're constantly operating according to well-doing and according to the fruits of the Spirit, then at some point people are going to go, well, wait a minute here. <laughs> this person is operating like this, and that's the fruits of the Spirit, and this person is not. So, by well-doing, okay, by well-doing, we put to silence ignorance and foolishness, okay? That's how we do it. Not by slamming our fists, not by extortion, not by coercion, not by insulting. And as you notice here, he says, as free, I love this part, and not using your liberty just like Paul says, for a cloak of maliciousness. So you're free because you're not under the traditions and the rudiments of the fathers. That's what he's saying in their time. And I think we can attach it to us, but use your liberty not for a cloak of maliciousness. So going to um, Galatians here for a quick bit, right? Where um, Paul said, you know, you've been called unto liberty, right? But don't use your liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but rather by love, serve one another. And you're going to see the same theme here. Same theme, okay? So you're free, but don't use your free freedom to be malicious. Use your freedom rather to do what? To be servants, serve one another in love, right? That's exactly what Paul says here. By love, serve one another. Use that liberty to by love, serve one another. You are free to love one another, which certainly implies, folks, that when we put ourselves under traditions and rudiments, you will put yourself under a bondage where you won't lead with love. You'll lead with the rudiments. And when people don't agree or do those traditions and rudiments, it will move you to justify your cruelty. And we don't want cruelty in Christianity. We want to, by love, serve one another, just like Paul said. And Peter is saying the exact same thing. We want to be servants of God. That's how we serve. We don't use our liberty for a cloak of maliciousness. It's not an excuse. Even if you disagree with someone, it's not an excuse to be cruel. That's not what we do. That's not how we operate. Okay. And this is further proof, folks, where he says, honor all men. Do you want to make that, uh, well, well, just all men we agree with or all people we agree with. Is that what you're going to go with there? It says, honor all men. Do you want to alter the word all there? Because you're going to have trouble in this line doing that. You're going out of your way to do it, right? And if you do that, I'm going to suggest it's because you want to be able to justify being dishonorable to people who disagree with you, okay? You can disagree with people honorably and respectfully. You can do that. And that's the primary call here. In fact, I would suggest it's always the call. You can peacefully protest. You can peacefully and honorably say to someone, what you're doing is wrong here, but it doesn't have to turn into maliciousness. Okay. It doesn't have to, you're supposed to honor all men. And then he says, love the brotherhood. And there's that kind of especially situation, right? You know, yeah, you, you know, you can raise the bar for the brotherhood, but that loving the brotherhood doesn't mean you dishonor other people who are not par part of the brotherhood. Okay, that's the deal. And by the way, if someone says, you know, Shade, I don't think you're a brother. Okay, well then honor me then. D do you see? It, it doesn't default to cruelty. It defaults to honorability. That's what it defaults to. So therefore, no Christian cruelty here. You disagree with me? You're not a brother, Shade. Well, then don't call me names. Honor me. See, love your enemies. Oh, you, I'm an enemy. Okay, love me. Bless those who curse you. See, they, but that's not the default. Why? Why is that happening? Because they're leading with their interpretation of the text rather than the most important and greatest commandment, love others as self. It's not love others as self 
as long as they meet your requirements. It's love others as self, period, even if they don't meet your requirements. That's the calling of the believer to take it to that degree, okay? That's where we're pushing. And amongst the brotherhood of people saying that Jesus is the Son of God, I think we should be able to do that. But if we can't even do that within the congregation of the brotherhood, then how are you going to ever honor all people? How are you ever going to follow this commandment? If you can't even do this properly, if we can't even do this properly, how are we going to honor all people? It's not going to be possible. And again, you see this lift, fear God, but still honor the small K king. So we can protest against the small K king if they're doing something wrong, but we do it honorably with respect, firmly, courageously. We speak the truth, but we do it honorably. We don't have to use cruelty and insult and maliciousness to do it. In fact, I would suggest to you, we're not supposed to at all. Okay. So there's the highest reverence to fear God, right? That's the highest reverence of the Christian, right? The next is to, I would suggest very, very close to it is love the brotherhood. That's the next thing. But doing these two things, I think are connected, but it doesn't allow you to dishonor the king and dishonor all other people. It's quite the opposite. The default is be honorable regardless. Okay. So that's the point. Okay. That's why it's, it's especially the household of faith, not just the household of faith, not just people who you think is part of the household of the faith. Do you see? All right. So we're going to continue here. Um, this is going to be very interesting when you see the word reviled here. Okay. First Peter two, for even hereunto were you called because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us what an example Okay. It's not Christ did it. So you don't have to worry about it. Don't worry about it. He did it all that kind of thing. No, Christ left an example. Why? What does Peter say next? That you should follow his steps. Is that any different than when Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ? I'm going to suggest to you strongly. It's no different. It's the same message. You should follow his steps. So Peter is saying, follow Christ and his example. And he's going to show you what his example was by writing it in verse 22 and 23. And so this is what it means to walk Christ-like. It's not, hey, does that guy agree with the Athanasian Creed? Hey, does that is that guy a full preterist or not a full preterist? None of that matters. None of that matters. They, all those types of things didn't even exist in these epistles. All right. This is all about following the steps of Christ. And that's what it means to walk in the spirit of God and the spirit of Christ and the spirit of love because Christ is the express image of God and God is love, okay? So we lead with love. And that's the whole point here because we don't want to have Christian cruelty, right? That's, that's what we're talking about here. And so how did Jesus operate? What was his steps? How do we follow his steps? Well, we have to know what his step, steps are. Who did no sin, but look what he says. Neither guile was found in his mouth, okay? So no guile. And then he says this, who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. All right. So let's go to the Greek here. It's uh, 1 Peter here. 1 Peter 2. Let's see if we can grab this real quick for you guys. 1 Peter 2. And we want to get, I think it was 23. I want to I want to show you what this word means. Because sometimes I don't think people realize what this word means, reviled. And it's reviled, being reviled. He did not revile in return, right? We're going to click on both of these, okay? Let's start with this one. What does reviled mean? To abuse, revile. I revile a person to his face, abuse insultingly. Okay? So insulting people, right? So to revile, to spew bitter, tasteless, tasteless statements, properly to say harsh things, using mean, spirited, insulting words with the intention of what? Humiliating and or demoralizing. Okay? That's the deal there. So we have to be very, very cautious as to how we speak to people. This is on the same type of list as we mentioned before in the uh, counterfeit Christianity, the fruits of the spirit. Everybody looks at the, you know, adultery and, and witchcraft. Yeah, but it's also hatred and variance and holding grudges and speaking spitefully and evil speakings. And yes, mean-spirited, insulting words. So be careful the kind of words you're calling people. Why? Because it's mean-spirited and spews bitter, tasteless statements. And that's not the spirit of God. That's not the spirit of Christ. That's not what Jesus did. And it's very clear in scripture that he did not do that. Okay. So, you know, saying someone is doing something wrong, right. And inappropriate is one thing, but to smear their reputation, calling them names when you have no thing that they did wrong, 
now you're in the danger territory. You're the one that's saying what you're saying. And it's, again, he didn't revile again. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Hold on a sec. We want to click on the other word too. But it's very similar, even though it's a slightly different word. And it's the same intention, right? To revile in turn, abuse in return, give abuse for abuse, right? That eye for an eye thing. No, no, no. You, someone insulted you? Don't insult them back, you know? And by the way, if you're insulting someone and they've never insulted you, that's even worse. I don't know how else to say that. Okay, we're not even supposed to insult someone who's insulted us, right? I'm seeing Christians insulting people that haven't insulted them, didn't say a word to them or about them, yet they insulted them anyways. See, that's Christian cruelty. You're going out of your way to be cruel. And this is what happens when you elevate your interpretation of the text and make that your God, rather than making God is love and Christ and how he operated and following his steps and imitating Christ. That should be what your goal is, okay? That should be your goal. But when you don't lead with that, when you don't lead with love, God is love, you lead with your interpretation of the text, you make that your God, then you end up operating like your God, which is everybody has to agree with me and follow our traditions and rudiments and agree and confess the things that we say to confess. And then it'll move you to hypocrisy and to abuse people and or insult people that have never said a word about you. So you tell me, right? So I offer the idea that there's no room for Christian cruelty. That's not, that's not uh, our, our spot. That's not what we're supposed to do. And he says, when he suffered, he threatened not. You see that? No threats, no coercion, no extortion but committed himself to him. So Jesus committed himself to someone here, by the way, but I won't get lost, but Jesus didn't commit himself to himself. He committed himself to him that judges righteously. And as we already know, earlier on, it said that, and that's part of the reason why I included it, is that God, the Father, is no respect of persons and judges according to every man's work. Okay? So that's what the deal was there. And so he's committing himself to him. I'm going to suggest to you that's the Father that judges righteously. He doesn't judge unrighteously. That's why he's not a respecter of persons. Okay, so he's going to put the judgment on the one who's spewing the reviling. Okay, so whoever's doing the abusing and whoever's abusing, even if someone is abusing others, it's two wrongs don't make a right type of a scenario. So we try to walk in that kind of position that even when people are operating inappropriate towards us or we disagree with people, we do our best to walk in grace and mercy. All right. So, 1 Peter 3, 8 to 12. So, we're in the same epistle. I'd love to go through every line, guys, but I just can't. But I'm trying to grab these sections that always default to how we're supposed to operate. And he says here, Finally, be you all of one mind. Okay? And now here he's saying you all, not everybody in the world, right? He's talking to the believers. So, he specifies, finally, be you all. Not not when he says honor all men. He's not, he's not, he's just saying honor all men. You know, he didn't say honor all believers. No, he said honor all men. Here he says, finally, be you all of one mind. He doesn't expect the unbeliever to be one mind with you, but the believers should be, all right? Having compassion one of another. And look what he says immediately, love as brethren. That's always, see, finally, right? Here's the sum of the deal. Be of one mind and love the brethren, right? That's the deal. And then he includes, be pitiful, be courteous. This is why there should be no room for Christian cruelty, especially between Christians. Okay? Especially. All right? But even if not, what does he say next? You don't render evil for evil. Okay? That's, that's the deal. Don't render evil for evil. I mean, it's pretty plain here. Okay? Or railing for railing. And we're going to go to the Greek again, because I think people don't realize what, what railing means. All right? So we're going to go there. First Peter 3. Here we go. Thank you for your patience, guys. And we're going to go to verse 9, because I want you to know what railing means. And it's pretty clear here, actually. Don't repay evil for evil, or what? Insult for insult. So, even if you get insulted, don't insult back. Oh, you're a heretic, Bible-thumping goofball, or whatever, right? You, well, I'm sorry you, you feel that way. Have a great day. See? No insult back. And if you're insulting people that have never insulted you, that is just pure cruelty. And there's no love of God in that. All right. So that's what the word is. So people have convinced themselves in Christianity that if, as long as, you know, I don't know, they're not, I don't know, 
what whatever as long as they're not dealing with witchcraft and uh, idolatry and fornication they're good so now they can insult people no it's on the same list okay this is on the same list okay lying is on the same list stealing is on the same list insulting people especially people who've never even insulted you but even when people insult you our calling is a higher one that's why he says what he says right that's why he's saying to be pitiful and courteous and don't render, render evil for evil and don't insult for insult, okay? But contrary-wise, what does he say? Blessing. That's what he says. Contrary-wise, bless. So, you, say, oh, you know what? I'm sorry you feel that way. Go have a nice day. I hope you have a nice day, right? That, that's that's the, a better response than, oh, you called me this? Well, let me call you that. See? that's It's clearly not the lessons here, right? Knowing that you are there unto called, okay? So, this is, again, the fruits of the Spirit right? How am I going to judge But by what you said? Well, if you're, if you're insulting people that haven't insulted you, or quite frankly, if you're going out of your way to insult people uh, aggressively that haven't insulted you or have, then I'm allowed to kind of go, well, wait a minute here. Our calling is to, you know, maybe we have to keep silence. Maybe we have to walk away. Maybe, maybe we have to say, look, I politely disagree with what you're doing here. But at the end of the day, the primary position is clearly this. This is the fruits of the spirit and there's no room for cruelty in Christianity. So if there's cruelty in Christianity, there's a huge problem. Why? Because we're called that we should what inherit the blessing. And notice he's talking about inheritance here. This is very, you reap what you sow, okay? Contrary wise, he says, blessing knowing that you are there unto called that you should inherit a blessing, see? But if you're not blessing people, but rather you're railing for railing and in insulting for insulting and you're uh, giving them evil for evil, you still think you inherit a blessing? You still think you get 16 wings and a Ferrari in the house of God, even though you've been insulting people? Really? That's what you think. Well, Jesus is going to tell you otherwise. Okay? He's going to tell you otherwise. In fact, I think we can go there um, right now. Okay? Um, by the way, just as a, I want to include Galatians 6.10 which is not too far from Galatians 6, 2, which says, bear ye one another's burdens and fulfill the law of Christ. He says, as we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, okay? Everybody, okay? Especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Remember when I mentioned that? I hope I, hope I mentioned that. If not, here's the scripture. Now, do you think he means, well, just be good to the household of faith? How is that possible? That doesn't make any sense. This Line this up with First, uh, First Timothy 4.10. It's you're good to everybody, especially the household of faith. Honor everybody. Love the brotherhood, right? Especially the brotherhood. So it's not, well, only love the brotherhood, right? Or only be good to the household of faith. No, it's be good to everybody. That's the Christian calling. It's consistent, okay? It's very consistent, all right? And Jesus, of course, proves this further with his um, teachings. And I'm trying to show you how Peter and Paul and Jesus all saying the exact same message, right? And as you would that men should do to you, do you also to them likewise. He's not saying do to them as long as they did it to you first. No, he's saying you do to them what you would want them to do regardless. How do I know that? The next sentence, for if you love them which love you, what thank do you have? See, it's loving people that don't love you that's the higher calling, okay? I know it's difficult. I'm not saying it's easy, but that's the higher calling. And between brothers and sisters, okay, that are at least behaving somewhat piously, I don't think that should be that difficult. And yet I'm seeing a lot of Christians give themselves a justification to be cruel when people just disagree with something like their eschatology or something of this nature, or quite frankly, uh, creeds and confessions and traditional rudiments, and even like appearing um, on Sunday at a bricks and mortar building and using that as some kind of evidence of something. No, it's evidence of absolutely nothing. For sinners also love those that love them. See, he's saying that that's not a stretch, right? He's saying everybody does that, right? And if you do good to them, which do good to you, what thank do you have? Sinners also do the same. Everybody does that. Oh, hey, let me buy you a drink. Oh, great. I'll buy you a drink next week. Oh, okay. So this is just, I gave you five bucks and you gave me five bucks back. And I'm not, I'm not saying that's bad. I'm, I'm saying, and I don't think Jesus is saying that that's bad, but that's not the higher call. That, that's not going give to you, give you any heavenly rewards. You can't walk around saying, well, look, I, I bought that person a drink back after they bought me a Coca-Cola. I bought them a Coca-Cola. Yeah, everybody does that type of stuff. That's not a real stretch, okay? That's what he's saying. And if you lend to them of whom you hope to receive, what thank do you have, right? So if I lend you a hundred bucks, but I'm expecting you to pay me back at the end of the month, a lot of people do that. 
you think that's just Christians that, you know, attempt to do that from time to time? <laughs> no, he's saying for sinners also lend to sinners to receive the, the same again, right? So it's very, very clear that it's a higher calling. And that's where he goes. He says, but you guys love your enemies and do good and lend, okay? Hoping for nothing again. That's why I always tell people, listen, lend the amount that you don't expect. So if you think a hundred bucks is too much, then lend the 10 and say, you don't have to pay me back, Right. And then this way, if the worst case scenario, it's okay. You, you weren't expecting anything back. They could keep it. It's not a big deal. But if you expect the hundred back, well, then that can cause a bit of a problem. So I always push people in the direction to say, lend or loan or give the amount that you would, you don't care if they give it back to you or not. Okay. That's what Jesus is saying, I think. And then he links this to rewards. Okay. So this is why I keep talking. Remember the inheritance, you inherit a blessing. It's the same idea here, folks, right? It's the same kind of communication when he says, you know, contrary wise, you bless. Why? Because that's what you were called to do and you inherit a blessing. So when you bless people who are cursing you or railing you or being evil towards you, that's the higher calling and that's the reward base. Your reward is great when you lend and you do good and you love your enemies, right? And he says, your reward shall be great and you shall be the children of the highest. And there it is, fruits of the spirit right there. Right, right there. And then he moves into the character of God, I would suggest, for he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. And you have to reconcile that in your theology and your soteriology. Okay, I already have. Okay, but I don't know how you reconcile he's kind to the evil and he's kind to the unthankful and then you get to be cruel to people. How are you reconciling that? How are you reconciling the idea that you're walking in the spirit of Christ, the spirit of God, and you're being unkind and you're being cruel? or you're justifying your cruelty. Is that what you're doing? Well, I don't want you to do that. You come to this channel, I'm gonna push you towards the fruits of the spirit. Why? Because God is kind to the evil and the unthankful. And I would suggest you put that into your theology and put that into your soteriology before you start you know, having thinking you have the right to tell people that they're gonna be eternally damned and things of this nature, okay? Because you're offside, it's not your call for sure. We could at least agree to that. And then when you say that type of stuff, I fail to see how that uh, shows the kindness and how you're loving your enemies and you're doing good to you, to those who are, are not blessing you, right? I, no, you're supposed to bless those who curse you. You're supposed to love your enemies. You're not supposed to tell them they're eternally damned. So you have to fit that in your theology. Okay. God is kind to the evil and the unthankful. And then he says, be you therefore merciful as your father is what? Merciful. Okay. So that's the calling right there. Okay. And Peter is saying the exact same thing when he says we should f f um, fulfill his footsteps or follow his footsteps. That's what he's saying. And you're going to see the same stuff here. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil. See his tongue, not just, you know, again, where are we understanding in scriptures that you have a justification to wag your fingers continuously and tell everybody if they don't agree with you that somehow some shape way or form they are and you start labeling name calling right there you're supposed to be refraining your tongue from evil you're supposed to be refraining it and loose lips sink ships and it's probably yours that you're sinking and his lips that they speak no guile you're supposed to have a restraint on how you speak especially quite frankly if you're on a pulpit right? In front of a congregation. And the larger the congregation, the more the responsibility that you refrain your tongue and you're a little slower to speak, right? Loose lips, sink ships. And I'm going to say it again. It's yours that you're going to sink if you keep speaking guile and or evil and have evil speakings and render evil for evil and railing for railing and insult for insult when you are called. And I'm going to suggest to you, if you're putting it on video, I mean, really? <laughs> that's even more people that are going to see you having a difficult time holding your tongue. So that's the calling, all right? Let him eschew evil, get away from it, run away from the evil and do good. Boy, you know, this is kind of strange. You know, it's almost as if what we do and how we conduct ourselves actually does matter. Hmm, interesting. Do good, let him seek peace and ensue it. So you're supposed to be, right, seeking peace and pursuing that. And if you can't seek peace, peace and pursue that the least you can do then is askew the evil and just do good stuff okay even if you disagree okay disagree run away from what you think or get away or stay away from what you think is bad and do the good stuff and, and if you disagree with something just explain why you disagree with something explain your interpretation of the text and show it in your walk and you're going to see that that's going to be the primary way we actually show the love of god is in our conduct you're going to see that
Okay? And he says, for the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous. Now, what here is over the righteous ones who said what? Said something specific? Agreed with the Nicene Creed? Um, agreed with someone's eschatology? Any of that? No. The righteous are those who are not railing for railing, who are not speaking evil for evil, doing evil for evil. They're refraining their tongue. They're not speaking guile. They're being careful with what they say. Okay. And they're eschewing evil and they're doing good and they're seeking peace and they're pursuing peace. Those are the righteous here. What are you going to do? Go grab another scripture from Deuteronomy or something like that? No, don't do that. Stay in the context of the epistle. He's making it very, very clear what righteousness is in all manner of behavior. Okay, we need to try to be very consistent in what we see as how we operate. We should not take the position where we're justified in being cruel. And with all due respect, that's exactly what the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the scribes and the chief priests did. As soon as you, they you know, heard someone or saw someone that was challenging their positions, they went to justification of cruelty. That's what they did. And I don't think we should be doing that. And I think it's pretty clear that we shouldn't. And his ears are open unto their prayers. The prayers of a righteous man availeth much. And by the way, First Timothy chapter 5, I would suggest uh, uh, also a righteous woman. Okay? So his ears are open unto their prayers. Which ones? The ones that his eyes are over that are righteous. But here's the opposite of this. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. So if you're rendering evil for evil, how are you different? If you're rendering insult for insult, how are you different? If you're insulting when no one's insulted you, uh, wow, how are you different? <laughs> that's no, that's see. So his, his face is against you. His presence is against you when you do evil. And it doesn't matter what your big reason is. Okay. So we have to um, try to lean into not doing evil, even when people are doing and saying things that we disagree with. Okay. Um, I'm not an absolutist. I'm sure you could come up with an example of when that might be different, but I'm going to suggest to you somewhere between 90 and 99% of the time, this should be the default right here. Okay. That should be the default. Okay. We can always come up with a, one example, right? Don't do it like that. I'm talking about the primary position so that it's the primary reputation, if you will, of those who say we love God and we love his son, Christ Jesus, and we're walking in the spirit of, of holiness. Okay. This should be the aim. All right, let's continue here. Um, 1 Peter 4, For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness, lusts, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries, wherein they think it strange that you run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you. So here's where he's saying, you know, they're thinking it's strange that you're not going as crazy and wild and, you know, inappropriate as them, right? And they speak evil of you. I'll give you an example. All you know, those people think they're all holy, you know, goody two shoes or whatever, right? But look what he says here. And this is what I'm talking about. All shall give an account. He says, who shall give an account to him that is ready to, to judge the quick and the dead? What I'm suggesting to you here, folks, is, is that everybody gives an account. The, the they here, the who shall give an account is the ones who think that it's strange that these people have departed from excess of riot. They've departed from the excess of wine. They've departed from the lasciviousness. And they're like, well, that's weird. And they start talking bad about them. And they're going to give an account for their behavior and what they said about those speaking evil. They're going to give an account as to, okay, and exactly why were you speaking evil of them? Why were you doing that? Because they weren't committing idolatry, do you see? Because they weren't being lascivious, because they weren't in excess of wine. Why are you guys speaking evil, right? See, it's all based on why are you speaking evil of people who didn't do anything wrong? That's part of the deal here. And they're going to give that account. So this is why I say when Paul says everybody's going to show up before the judge, I think he means it. I think all means all. Okay, that's what I think. And I think this scripture proves it. He's not talking about the believers giving an account here. He said that earlier. Okay. He said that earlier. Um, this is a proof text that unbelievers go to the judgment seat as well. So what's the advantage of belief? Well, the belief is supposed to lead you to this. <laughs> the belief is supposed to lead you to positions where you're seeking peace and ensuing it and you're eschewing evil and you're doing good. See, and you're refraining your tongue because unbelievers don't tend to do this. But I've been noticing people who are claiming to believe, they've been tending to do the exact same things that unbelievers do. I'd refer to Luke 12 for that. Continue. 
All right. Um, and there is timeline relevance here, guys, by the way. He was ready to judge the quick and the dead. But as I've mentioned before, the judgment seat was established. Okay. So that's, I'm suggesting the beginning of the Messianic ages happened in 70 AD in full throttle. All right. First Peter 4, 7 to 9. But the end of all things is at hand. There's that, again, that timeline relevance. Be you therefore sober and watch unto prayer. And above all things, what does he say? What's above everything? What's, what, it's exactly what Paul said. There it is, agape love. All right, so we're going to go to um, the Greek here, guys, because I want to show people um, that it's agape love there. All right. First verse four, or excuse me, chapter four, verse eight. And because once again, I just want you to see the consistency. It's agape, all right? And, and he says that's above all things, okay? Benevolence, goodwill, esteem, right? And what does he say here? Typically refers to divine love, what God prefers, okay? So we do what God prefers. That's the calling, right? That's the step up. That's the higher calling, if you will. That's why he says above all things. Now, do you think he means just above some things there? No, all things. Does that include faith? Does that include creeds? Does that include eschatology? Does that include, uh, I don't know, Trinity doctrines and how you see the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost? I'm going to suggest to you, he just said above all things, okay? That's what he said. And he went right to love, not, not creedal confessions that were made in 325 or 381, okay? Or 150 AD. This is the universal language. This is love works no ill. When you are operating according to agape love, how can anyone charge you with anything? If you're not rendering evil for evil, how can anyone charge you with anything? Your belief is supposed to move you into that direction. All right. I'm not saying believing isn't good. Believing is, I'm saying there's a purpose behind the belief. The belief is to move you to the mercy of God. And you tasted that the Lord is gracious and you extend that mercy and grace. Why? Because love works no ill and it's above all things. And yes, we're going to see it again later. It's above even faith and hope because it's this that empowers our faith in the proper direction and has it operating properly right? So that there's no Christian cruelty because there really should be no such thing. And he says, having um, all, above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves, which lines up, of course, with what Jesus says, they will know you are my disciples by how you love one another. And I'm seeing um, that not happening. And why? Because love shall cover the multitude of sins. You need to fit this into your theology. See, too, there's too many Christians that say, well, I believe in Jesus and therefore all my sins are covered as if God is blinding himself and making himself deaf, blind, and mute. And every time you do something really bad, it's okay. And every time somebody else does it, he just totally, you know, goes nuts on them. No, there's a continuance here, folks. Jesus paid for the sins of the whole world, but the continuance that we walk in his footsteps is the calling. Okay. So, for charity, agape love covers a multitude of sins. So we're supposed to continue operating like this. If it's just believing in Jesus, why, why, do, why is Peter saying agape love covers a multitude of sins? Well, if you just believe in Jesus, that covers the sins. No, 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 no. Jesus paid for the sins of the whole world. Our calling as believers is to operate as he operated, walking in his footsteps, not rendering evil for evil. And then when we do that, I'm going to suggest the, the world's light might increase. Why? Because our light is increasing, right? And so love covers a multitude of sins. So we respond with kindness, decency, peace, as much peacefulness as we possibly can, which includes sometimes when we're protesting, we're saying, hey, this is wrong. We do it with um, courage and boldness, but also with peacefulness and with honor. Okay, that's what we're shooting for. That's what we're aiming for. I'm not saying it's easy, but that's the calling, right? And we need to be doing it amongst ourselves before we can do it with the rest of the world. Do you see that? How are you going to be able to do this with the rest of the world in any shape, way, or form if, you can't, if we can't do it amongst ourselves? Okay, that's the deal, all right? So why do I hang with people that love me as themselves? Uh, because that's the spirit of God, the spirit of Christ, the spirit of love. That's why. And when people are kind and decent and moral and fair to me, then clearly the experience is going to be better. <laughs> okay. And guess what? Paul says in first Timothy, right? Hos hospitable, right? Use hospitality one to another without grudging. Okay. So we're supposed to be hospitable towards one another. So again, that's the calling towards one another. And we're supposed to be honorable, honorable to everyone else. 
So let's continue here. First Peter 4, and again, not a great chapter break, um, but 4.19 to 5 to 3, okay? Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing. This is how we keep the keeping of our souls. We commit the keeping of our souls to him. How, how do we do that? What's our part? In well-doing. <laughs> That's what it is. So when we do well, you know, we're, we're committing to the will of God here and committing the keeping of our souls in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ. He witnessed it, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Now this is very important. Let next two lines really hit it home, guys. Feed the flock of God, which is among you, taking the oversight, not overlording the oversight. There's a difference. This is a shepherd. This is a shepherd, okay? A shepherd, a protector, a kind protector. This is an oversight, not an overlording over the sheep, an oversight of the sheep. Okay, there's a difference. Not by constraint, but willingly, not by, or excuse me, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. And he makes it very clear here, neither as being lords over God's heritage. Okay, you don't own God's heritage. I don't own God's heritage. Okay. We're overseers and we're supposed to act like that. We're not supposed to be overlords. And you're going to see this in the Greek. So let's go to um, 1 Peter um, and we're going to go 5 3. Okay. I think this is going to be very, very helpful for you guys to under, to see it in the Greek. It's very, very compelling, I think. All right. So here we go 5 3. And as you're going to see here, not as exercising lordship over. Okay. Don't exercise lordship over them. That's not how we roll, okay? How do we roll? It says, but examples being to the flock. We're being examples to the flock. We lead by example. That's the deal, okay? Being examples to the flock. That's how we do it. We don't slam our fists and say, if you don't agree with what I said, you're going to get kicked out right now. And you're a heretic if you don't agree with this. And you're a heretic if you agree with that. And you're an idiot, whatever. All these names and stuff like that. That's not how, how we um, feed the sheep. That's not how we do that. And that's part of the reason I have a Feed the Sheep series for the members. Because it's for those who are interested in actually walking in the light and the love of God and, and the way Christ did. And I'm not so sure that everybody wants to do that. And I have to be quite direct because of that cruelty that I see within Christianity. I witness it. I've experienced it. And it's off. It's wrong. Okay? It's, that's the deal. So you're not supposed to be overlording over people. That's, that's not how we do it. Does Jesus back this up? Yes, indeed, he does. He says the exact same thing. Exact same thing. Okay, but let's focus on what Jesus says when it comes to how we are supposed to be overseeing the flock rather than overlording. He says the exact same thing. Jesus called them unto him. He's talking to his disciples. And he said, you know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them. And they that are great exercise authority upon them. But it shall not be so among you. That's not how you guys are going to operate. But whosoever will be great among you, let him be your helper. Okay. Who, who are the great ones in the kingdom of God? It's the helpers, not the ones who are slamming their fists and exercising authority all over the place and telling you you're out of here if you don't listen to us. That's, that's not how you're great in the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Christ. No, that's not how you're great. You're great by being a helper. That's it. That's the deal. So how great are you if you're not helping, but rather you're just wagging your fingers all day hmm? and insulting people and speaking evil continuously. You tell me. And whosoever will be chief among you, you want to be chief in the kingdom of God? Well, you want to be Christ-like? Let him be your servant. Isn't that exactly what Peter is saying here? Neither is being lords over God's heritage, but rather examples to the flock, right? And in fact, when we go to just briefly, let's go back up to 2, um, 16 here, you're going to see it again, right? Using your freedom, your liberty, not for a cloak of maliciousness, right? And not for super overlordship, but as servants of God. Servants, servants. That's exactly what Jesus is saying here. Let him be your servant. You want to be chief? You got to be the servant. That's exactly what is being said here in 1 Peter 2, verse 16. Okay? Use that freedom that God has given you through his son, Christ Jesus. Walk in the spirit to be a servant of God. That's the deal. It's, it's, that's, the, that's the scenario here. Okay? So coming back down to um, 1 Peter uh, 5, 3, I think that's where we're at, right? Neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. And we know. It's, you don't do that. You don't exercise lordship. It's through example. Let him be your servant. If you want to be chief, serve. You want to be great in the kingdom of God? Help. Right? That's, that's the deal. 
even as the Son of Man. And now it's, it's compared to walking like Christ who set an example, all right? And what he said, I came not to be ministered unto. I didn't come to be ministered unto. In fact, I came to what? To minister, even to the point of giving his life a ransom. Do you see that? The sacrifice he gave of himself, right? He didn't, um, he, he was a servant of God. That's what he did. He served and he was great because he, he was the greatest helper and the biggest sacrifice one could imagine. Okay? And that's exactly what Peter is talking about here. So how are we supposed to lead and feed the flock? We don't own God's heritage. And by the way, the grace of God is not yours to declare who gets the grace of God. Okay? It's not yours to declare because it's not your grace. God, it's God's grace to mankind. It's God's mercy towards mankind. Therefore, right? If you've received grace, your calling is to extend it. If you've received mercy, your calling is to extend it. Not to tell people who got it and who didn't. You don't have that authority. And that's what happens when you start getting into overlordship rather than walking as examples and showing people walking the walk, right? That draws people. And that's further proof, folks, that the only way you can do that is not by slamming your fists and insisting that everybody agrees, you know, with everything that you have decided you've interpreted from the text or otherwise, okay? It's, yes, faith abides and hope, yes, and agape love. But what's the greatest of these? Agape love. And if that's the greatest, then that's the greatest. And there's no greater thing that you can do, okay? And that's, I'm going to say it again, greater than faith. And people have decided that their belief system and their interpretation of the text is what their faith is and that that's more important than loving others as self and honoring people and loving their enemies and blessing those who curse them, which is the direct instruction of not only the apostles, but of Christ Jesus, whom we say is our Lord. So what's greater than faith and hope? Agape, love. And that's the deal. And I'm going to suggest strongly if we operate by leading with agape love, then Christian cruelty will be no more. All right, guys. Well, thank you so much. I hope this message, which I wanted it to kind of link up with the counterfeit Christianity uh, video, I hope this message is moving you to really think about what it means, what it means to... Um, walk in the spirit of God or walk in the spirit of Christ. What does that mean? And, and why are we seeing such cruelty? You know, folks, our interpretation of text, when you see it applied in reality, you're allowed to look at that and say, well, wait a minute, we've been applying this interpretation and things aren't going in the right direction. And we're seeing things get darker and darker and things of this nature. Well, could it be because our interpretation of the text is overriding the love of God is overriding the greatest commandment. And I'm going to suggest to you that that's exactly what is happening. And I'm going to suggest to you very strongly that Christianity should have no cruelty, but rather Christianity should be loaded with kindness. I hope this message finds you well. And in the meantime, guys, remember, do all things with grace and peace.